thinking. Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. Think all it takes to escape the dangers of the nuclear industry is to close down reactors? Think again. This week, we speak with Donna Gilmore of SanOnofreSafety.org about the ongoing dangers we still face from the shuttered San Onofre nuclear reactors on the coast of Southern California. It's a look into the future every community will face as it shuts down reactors and moves into the what-do-we-do-with-the-waste-George phase of nuclear industry numbnutsery. Then Scott Portsline of TMI Alert, the Three Mile Island Group, gives us a heads-up on a new danger faced by nuclear facilities in the cyber espionage age. All this, plus numbnuts of the week, and your weekly dose of anti-nuclear snark will be coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, July 1st, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. We are starting out here in the United States, where the waste isolation pilot plant, the WIP, site in Carlsbad, New Mexico, is again in the news. And that because there have been radiation spikes at the WIP facility that have hit the highest levels since the initial hours of the radioactive release on February 14 and 15. The government has been analyzing samples for what they call potential impact on human health, which is interesting given that there are already 22 workers from the WIP site who have been found to have internal contamination from the plutonium and americium release. There were documents related to this up on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Nuclear Materials Events Database, known as NMED, but the document links have been removed from the website and as of this time of recording have not been restored. If we find links, we will provide them. Meanwhile, we will see if Don Hancock, of Southwest Research and Information Center, our source on all things dealing with WIP, will be available next week for an update. We've been following the story of the anencephaly cluster, the birth defect dealing with the spinal cord and brain that is always fatal, up in Washington State in the counties that contain and surround the Hanford site, And now there is further information that is every bit as startling as what we've already covered. And that is that in 2011, Washington State had its highest levels ever recorded for total fetal deaths, which was 20% above the 2010 records. Death via congenital abnormalities, which includes the anencephaly cluster, 60% above the 2010 numbers. Deaths via complications of the placenta and other in utero problems, 20% above the 2010 records. All of these are record high numbers, and it's notable that these levels returned to historical norms as of 2012. What this points to is the plume that came across from Fukushima and its impact on Washington State, which was hit very hard and very directly when the plume hit the shores of the western United States. In a related story, Change.org has put out a petition to protect the workers at the Hanford site, which is called the most contaminated workplace in America. It has made hundreds of workers sick from chemical vapors, including 38 in just the past few months. The Hanford nuclear site is where the United States made plutonium for the Nagasaki bomb, and subsequently for the U.S. arsenal of tens of thousands of nuclear weapons during the Cold War. The site is a toxic and radioactive danger area, and workers there are exposed to radioactive chemicals and other hazards on a daily basis. 
Yet Hanford, a federal facility run by the U.S. Department of Energy, has exempted itself from worker safety oversight and has failed to offer meaningful protections to workers as required by their own regulations. This is especially true when it comes to exposure to chemical vapors that emanate from Hanford's 177 million gallon underground radioactive waste tanks. For more information, you can go to HanfordChallenge.org and click on Vapors. You can also view the King 5 Seattle television station's Peabody award-winning investigative series entitled Hanford's Dirty Secrets. Susanna Frame, the investigative reporter in charge of this series, has been interviewed previously on Nuclear Hot Seat. She does a great job. Meanwhile, Change.org has a petition they want you to sign. We'll have a link up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog under today's episode number 158. Word keeps getting out in the oddest places about increasing worry on the west coast of the United States over Fukushima radiation, and for good reason. Some of the publications include Trium, which is a publication of Canada National Laboratory. It cites radiation experts as talking on the aftermath of the Fukushima nuclear plant meltdown in 2011, which they interestingly refer to as a partial meltdown. I don't know how less partial this could be than three reactors that melted down, but in any event, not to quibble over semantics, as I usually do. They were talking about the importance of the sampling the department is conducting off the coast of Vancouver Island to monitor the transport of radioactive contaminants via ocean currents from Fukushima. The International Fish Oil Standards Program, IFOS, is now testing fish oil samples for radiation, with Wiley's Finest as its first adopter. According to Natural Doctors International, or NDI, there has been a substantial increase in consumer inquiries in the wake of Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster. Consumers in the natural channel have consistently communicated that radiation contamination in fish oil is a significant concern with consumers. Professor Dale Dewar of the University of Saskatchewan's Department of Family Medicine is quoted as saying, We really do not know the extent of the ionizing radiation that's going to be reaching us from Fukushima. We are just watching the West Coast unfold. One of the really frightening things about ionizing radiation is that effects such as even the most rapidly growing cancers, like leukemia and thyroid cancers, are not visible in an exposed population until several years after. Part of the reason we do not know the full extent is that nobody is officially monitoring it, and that's a very scary thought. We always say that levels are negligible or permissible, because it's likely not going to harm us immediately, and exposure is not going to show up in measurable statistical levels right away. But there is no safe level of radiation. The Statesman Journal of Salem, Oregon, reports that Oregon officials are not looking for cesium-134, the fingerprint of radiation from Fukushima, to which local resident Zach Adams added, We're really concerned about radiation affecting the fisheries, the wildlife, the tourism, and most importantly, our health. There's a big black hole where information should be. In the Midwest of the United States, Great Lakes communities are still struggling in their fight against a proposed nuclear waste facility. For the past 15 years, Ontario Power Generation has been working to obtain approval from the Canadian government to build an underground repository near the Great Lakes to store its nuclear waste. As the approval process for the deep geological repository nears an end, some concerned citizens, actually a lot of them, have started a petition asking lawmakers in Canada, as well as in the United States, to block the approval of the proposed nuclear waste repository near the Bruce Nuclear Power Plant site in Kincardine, Ontario. Almost 61,000 people have signed the petition so far. The proposed repository's location is just about half a mile from the shores of Lake Huron. If radioactive nuclear waste leaked into the water, the 40 million Canadians and Americans 
who depend on the Great Lakes for their drinking water, would find themselves without access to a source of clean, fresh water. In one of the articles I read for this story, I came across a quote from Emily Hammond, a law professor at the George Washington University Law School and a scholar at the Center for Progressive Reform. She said, Nuclear waste repositories are some of the safest places you could put anything on Earth, as the facilities are, quote-unquote, over-designed. I wonder if she's heard of the waste isolation pilot plant, the leaking, currently shut down WIP site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. William Fife, a retired University of Western Ontario professor who worked as an international consultant on nuclear waste before he passed away last fall, voiced his concerns about the project due to the site's close proximity to water. The late Fife said, It is universally acknowledged that nuclear waste must be kept away from water circulating through the environment of living things, since water is seen as the main vehicle for eventual dissolution and dissemination of radiotoxic pollutants. Michigan Congressman Dan Kildee also cited the WIP site when he said, These nuclear waste storage sites, although often said to be impenetrable, are not perfect as this radiation leak shows. He went on to say, I continue to have great concerns with locating a similar nuclear waste site less than a mile from Lake Huron in Ontario. Storing nuclear waste so dangerously close to the Great Lakes is just too much of a risk to take, he continued. Michigan and our shared water basin with Canada would be forever changed if a nuclear radiation leak were to happen. Such contamination would also have a drastic effect on the livelihood and well-being of both Michiganders and Canadians. More than 50 cities and towns in Ontario and in the United States bordering the Great Lakes have passed resolutions opposing the Deep Geologic Repository. Which brings us to this week's Nuclear Hot Seat Nuclear Hot Seat Nuclear hot seed, none that sound awake. So when is an unusual event at a nuclear reactor not an unusual event at a nuclear reactor? When it only happens for a really short time and nobody notices. In Iowa, the Dwayne Arnold nuclear power plant. Dwayne Arnold sounds like a comedian from a failed sitcom. Anyway, Dwayne Arnold had a little bit of a problem yesterday, June 30th, for a condition that briefly, only briefly, met the emergency action level for an unusual event, but did not warrant declaration of an emergency classification. Why not? Where is that exemption? Where is that footnote in the rules of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for a level one problem at a nuclear power plant? Well, it seems that it took a detailed review of conditions that existed during a thunderstorm that took place yesterday and revealed that the backup 50-meter wind speed briefly indicated 95.5 miles per hour, which exceeds the criteria of 95 miles per hour. The primary 50-meter wind speed indicator did not exceed 89 miles per hour. What's the difference between the primary? This was a secondary one. This was the one that they don't pay attention to. Operators in the control room said that they did not observe wind speed exceed 80 miles per hour. Well, where were they and what were they looking at? And why isn't there an alarm on the darn thing when something exceeds a stated limit? You know, when it comes to things nuclear, there's no such thing as being a little bit pregnant. You're either within the stated safety zone or you have exceeded it, even by a little. It doesn't take much, and this all needs to be known. But, of course, nobody noticed it when it happened. And so the basis for the emergency classification no longer existed at the time of discovery. Eh, let's just ignore the darn thing. How often does that take place at nuclear reactors This is just an example where they got caught. And that's why you, the engineers at Dwayne Arnold, 
that sitcom nuclear power plant in Iowa are this week's nuclear hot seat. None that sound a week. Over to Japan now, where according to a government-funded study, that's a Japanese government-funded study, Fukushima has released up to 120 quadrillion becquerels of radioactive cesium into the North Pacific Ocean. Now, that number exceeds the Chernobyl total, which accounted for releases deposited on land and the ocean, while the number in Japan does not include what fell on the land, just into the ocean. So if there's any debate anymore about Fukushima being the worst since Chernobyl, could we please take the word since Chernobyl out of the conversation? This is the worst, and it's not over yet. Surprisingly, the work was partially supported by a grant in aid from the Japanese Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology. I wonder how that one got by the nuclear censors. A P. Basu of the German Federal Office for Radiation Protection has released a report from that office, Plutonium Emission from the Fukushima Accident. It states, while much has been published on environmental contamination and exposure to radioiodine and radiocesium, little is known about releases of plutonium. The explosions seem to have produced further structural damage in the containments and released large amounts of radionuclides into the environment. Certainly, some plutonium has been released with liquid effluents and discharged into the ocean. This same study reports that Fukushima plutonium has been found in a playground 60 kilometers, about 37 miles, from the nuclear plant. It goes on to state that up to 14 million becquerels of plutonium-239 and 240 were released, some of it possibly in the form of fuel fragments from the explosion at Unit 3. In this post from Chernobyl Children, Fukushima Children, and also the Rainbow Warriors, both on Facebook, they spoke about mutations by saying, a mutation does not mean big mutations per se like a child with no arms. Mostly it means tiny, hidden mutations. For example, a particular weakness, a part of the personality, a susceptibility, or just the malignancy of certain tumors. Something that we see as normal. Weak points are part of the normality. Are increasing amounts of weak points still normal? Yes, until a climax is reached. These mild mutations, after ten generations and more, become the most severe mutations if this genetic information does not die out. And this then leads to extinction. There were tritium tests with mice. All mice died after 25 generations. As long as a gene pool and reproduction produce enough healthy offspring, there is a balance between life and death, a balance of normality with the weaknesses. But these small mutations are explosively increased by the quote-unquote low-level emissions. Limits do not exist for atoms. Time does not exist for atoms. Our long generations take too long to react to changes. In this light, even now it is still too early to say how bad the genetic effects of the atomic bombings will become because often genetic changes also mean that the person affected cannot reproduce. And then this line also dies out. Moving right along, this item from our friend Iori Mochizuki and his wonderful blog, Fukushima Diary. He writes, The ice cream brand Kuru Kuru Soft of Izaki Glico Company is made in Minamisoma City, Fukushima. That's what it proudly states on the package. One of Iori's readers then queried Glico by phone and got the answer that the ice cream products of Izaki Glico Company are made of Fukushima milk and manufactured in Fukushima as well. Mm -mm -mm. And another reader posted on Twitter that Thai Airways International Public Company Limited serves Glico's ice cream with an in-flight meal. Mm Mm-mm. Delicious. 
And then former NHK announcer June Hori posted on Twitter that JAL, Japan Airlines, serves candy made out of Fukushima apple when you get on board. The candies are piled on a counter next to a paper that says, JAL's Northeast Japan Support Project. These are the candies made of Fukushima apple. Please feel free to take. No explanation was forthcoming of the dangers of internal radiation which come from ingesting radionuclides. But we couldn't expect that, could we? We will post a picture of that sign and the pile of candies on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under episode number 158. And both of these stories are truly numbnuts adjacent. A little bit of good news out of Japan. Despite the frenetic efforts of Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe Baby and his entire government to restart at least one of the nation's shutdown nuclear reactors, this summer Japan will once again be entirely nuclear-free in the production of its energy. Kyushu Electric Power Company's Sendai reactors were chosen to lead the restart effort, but last week had to submit additional documentation to the country's Nuclear Regulation Authority. The utility had submitted its initial documents in April, but the authority found 42 flaws in the application. This according to the Asahi Shimbun. Correcting those flaws took longer than the utility had planned, and now the earliest the reactors can restart, given the regulatory process, is September. More than half the residents in Ichikiku Shikino, a town of 30,000, only three miles from Sendai, have signed a petition opposing restart of the reactors. The issue there is the failure of the utility and governments to provide workable evacuation plans and whether any such plans could prove feasible. According to a report from Reuters, residents say a narrow road designated as an evacuation route regularly floods at high tide. The area is served by three major highways, all of them nominally congested. Some 21,000 people live within the evacuation zone for the Sendai reactors. So the battle over Japan's energy future goes on. But the longer the country lives without its nuclear reactors, and the more renewable energy that is installed while the reactors are closed, the more clear it becomes that Japan simply does not need them anymore despite Prime Minister Abe Baby's protestations to the contrary. Thanks to NIR's President Michael Marriott for this report. We'll have our interviews in just a moment, but first, Nuclear Hot Seat continues to reach out to people around the world who are concerned about the dangers of nuclear. We are especially active in Japan with our Voices from Japan series, which posts in two languages. With our increasing audience comes increasing bandwidth charges to support all the downloads, plus the usual charges from website hosting, artwork, site maintenance, and a whole slew of expenses that must be met to keep this program running. If you've donated to help us in the past, you've got my thanks and ongoing gratitude. If you've not yet donated or you'd like to help out again, please do. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com. Scroll down on the home page and click on the big red donate button. Your assistance will go directly to helping me help you keep up to date on all things anti-nuclear. So whatever you can do to help, many thanks. Now, the interviews. This week, we speak with Donna Gilmore, one of the activists deeply involved in the actions that helped to shut down the San Onofre nuclear reactors in Southern California. We all celebrated that success and thought it was the end of the risk. But according to Donna, it only opened up a whole new set of negative possibilities brought to you by the obscenely overfunded nuclear industry. Now Donna, who is the founder of SanOnofreSafety.org, Donna brings us up to speed on the next phase of nuclear industry shenanigans, the problems of storing high burn-up fuel and dry cask storage. What could go wrong? She'll fill us in on all the possibilities. 
It's a set of issues that more and more communities will need to address as their local reactors get shut down for good. Note that when Donna says CPUC or PUC, she's referring to the California Public Utilities Commission, and when she says PV, it is to California Public Utilities Commission President Michael R. PV. Donna Gilmore, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you very much. We've all just been through the San Onofre steam generator failures and the closure of both reactors on the coast of Southern California. Have we learned any lessons to avoid future ratepayer boondoggles? I think the citizens have, but I don't think Southern California Edison or our California Public Utility Commission or Nuclear Regulatory Commission have learned any lessons and we're getting ready to have another boondoggle. What's this next boondoggle? Now that the plant is shut down, Southern California Edison wants to expedite moving the fuel out of the spent fuel pools where it's currently cooling and into dry canisters, into a dry cast system, they call it. And that's not a problem putting it in dry storage. They just need to wait for the proper cooling time and they need to use these dry canisters that are going to hold up. Unfortunately, they've again chosen profits over safety, and they want to procure this new canister that's even worse than the one they've been using. It's a new home brand, and it holds 32 fuel assemblies. The previous one held 24, and... This new canister, they're, they're shoving 32 fuel assemblies, which is spent fuel, into a space normally designed for 24. And in addition, they're using really skinny 5 eighths of an inch thick stainless steel. That 5 eighths of an inch stainless steel is all that's keeping us safe from that fuel getting out, from the radiation getting out. And there's much better technology on the market but Edison is not even pursuing using that. I'm hoping to get the Public Utility Commission, a number of us hoping to get the Public Utility Commission to stop the bidding process for the CAS that they currently have and to start over and to have an independent analysis of the best CAS technology. We're risking Southern California here. And the only thing protecting us is five-eighths of an inch of stainless steel. That, that is unacceptable. The nuclear industry used to use a dry cast called a castor. It has 20-inch thick cast iron, ductile cast iron, which means it'll, it's a kind of elastic so it won't, won't become brittle. And the industry dropped using the castor technology, the cast iron technology, because of cost. And what's critical now is not only are we faced with having to store this short term, but the NRC has finally admitted we've got no long-term solution for this spent nuclear fuel anywhere in the nation. The NRC is currently working on studies to see what's going to hold up for up to 300 years. That's what they call interim storage. So right now, we have tons of nuclear waste sitting right near the beach, right in Southern California, right at the San Diego Orange County border, and the Edison's planning to use CAS that won't get NRC approval for more than 20 years. This, this is material that needs to be kept from the environment and from people for hundreds and hundreds of years. Let's roll this back just a little bit so we get a picture of the magnitude of the problem. How many fuel assemblies are there at San Onofre that still need storage? And give us a sense as to how long the proper cooling time is before the fuel assemblies can even be put into a dry cask. San Onofre has almost 2,800 fuel assemblies. There's 2,776 fuel assemblies that need to cool and then be put in, in dry canisters. In terms of how long they need to cool, the ones that contain the higher burn-up fuel is this fuel that's burned longer allowed to burn longer in the reactors. It could be up to 15 years total. However, um, San Onofre is planning to shorten that time period 
which is a dangerous thing to do because the shorter the cooling period, you know, the higher the risk of failure in the, in the canisters, especially for the higher burn-up fuel. But they're taking, you know, they're just taking one shortcut after after another. Right, they're kicking the problem down the road so that maybe they outlive when the problem actually comes due. The NRC will only approve these canisters for 20 years for high burn-up fuel. They will not renew these 20-year licenses because the data isn't there to support that the high burn-up fuel can be safely stored, let alone transported, for more than 20 years. It's a huge problem. It seems like this is a tremendous waste to spend tens of millions of dollars on dry tasks that are not approved for more than 20 years because there will just be additional costs down the line, if not the danger of something going wrong between now and then. What has the NRC done about this, and what is the activist awareness about how we can move through this problem? What needs to be done? The NRC and the Department of Energy, they have a a demonstration project. They're spending our money for a demonstration station project where they put some high burn-up fuel in a dry cast. In fact, one that isn't even approved for high burn-up fuel now, even for 20 years. And then they're going to kind of watch and see what happens. So that's their their plan over the next 10 or 15 years, which, of course, is, is no real solution, no real solution at all. Now, one of the things that I find interesting is that we have this Blue Ribbon Commission report where the commission recommended having interim storage, taking all this fuel, putting it in in dry canisters, and then storing it at some interim site, you know, maybe four around the country, something like that, eventually, after it's stored at at the plant. And one of the people on that commission is uh, Per Peterson. He's currently a a nuclear energy professor and is a well-respected nuclear expert. Well, he was not aware, I found this out very recently, he was not aware that after the fuel was put in the dry canister that the protective cladding around the fuel can continue to degrade, which means our first layer of protection, which is this cladding, this zirconium cladding material, could disintegrate and then our only protection will be that skinny five-eighths inch stainless steel sitting and rusting near, near the coast. I, ha- I actually received an email from Pear. I sent him the, the study that confirmed what I was saying, and he wrote back and he said, you're right, Donna. He said he wasn't aware that the cladding could fail after it's in dry storage. So to me, this just throws a big monkey wrench in the entire Blue Ribbon Commission report. They base it on false assumptions. I find it shocking that somebody who is such an acknowledged expert, he is UC Berkeley nuclear engineering professor, was not even aware of the problems of high burn-up fuel and had to be informed of it by someone who is an activist and who is certainly not a nuclear engineer. No, I, you know, my background is doing systems analysis and automating systems. Uh, I'm used to researching various businesses and learning their business before I automate anything. That's the key to having a successful system. So I've, I've turned my talents to doing research and uh, analysis on the nuclear waste issue. I'm, I'm working with some nuclear engineers and nuclear physicists, so I have some people that I can talk to and make sure I'm interpreting information correctly. So that's been very very effective, but I've been shocked at the lack of knowledge from so-called experts at the NRC, at the nuclear plant. This information doesn't doesn't seem to be getting out there, and it needs to be. I mean, we, we could lose Southern California if they don't store this material right the first time. We've got issues, for example, being near the coast. If you live near the coast, you know we've got issues of metal rusting. Well, this stainless steel is no different. And the NRC uh, have a document of theirs showing that they could have what's called stress corrosion cracking, which means the stainless steel can actually crack from the corrosion, and then that radiation would be released. And what's even worse than that is this zirconium cladding creates hydrides, 
and you mix that with moist air, if moist air gets in there, you can actually have hydrogen explosions, and then we can have our own little Fukushima right here in, in Southern California. So this is this a serious... Is, this is devastating information on a very serious issue. One of the things you did make me aware of is that you feel that Edison needs to stop their current bidding process because the quality of the dry cap system that they are currently considering is so inferior. How might that bidding system be changed? Edison currently have bids out, and they've gotten three companies bidding, but all of them use the inferior stainless steel quality. And then the one that Edison is most likely to pick is this new home 32 fuel assembly canister. It's even worse. We didn't get any quality companies bidding on this, so we need to urge the state elected officials, our local officials, we need them to put pressure on the Public Utility Commission, on the governor's office, to stop this bid and start over. None of us have seen what the specifications are they're even bidding, so I, I don't even know if they ended up eliminating some bidders because of whatever requirements they put in there. But we need to be able to get some of these better quality canisters being considered such as the Castor, C-A-S-T-O-R, something like that, where you have these really big, thick materials. And it also has the Castor and some of the others have these double-sealed lids that have sensors in them so they can de detect if radiation is, if the caps are getting hotter, they can detect if we may end up with a radiation leak. Also, they use helium instead of air when they store inside the canisters. And this can also detect if there's a helium leak, so you know that there's a leak. Now, the, the, the ones that Edison is choosing from, none of them have this sensor technology in them. So they've got no way to monitor what's going on inside those canisters, no way at all. That's insane. That's absolutely insane, and that needs to be stopped. But I do not think our Public Utility Commission is going to do anything. I did speak to Florio, one of the commissioners, and uh, I explained the situation to him, and he did have a positive comment. He says, well, we don't want to buy canisters and then have to turn around and buy them again. So he seemed somewhat concerned. But, you know, given our experience with the PC, you know, unless they get pressure from other than citizens, unless they get pressure from elected officials or from the governor's office, they're not likely to do anything different than what they're currently doing, which is just to allow Edison to pretty much do what they want. I spoke to the commissioners. I spoke to Florio in TV there recently at a Costa Mesa PUC hearing where I presented this information. And my first question to the PUC was, how are you going to prevent another boondoggle like the one we had with the steam generators? What are you going to do different so that this nuclear waste storage isn't going to be the next boondoggle? And they, it just stopped them cold. They all gave me this deer in the headlight look. I mean, it was clear. They had no clue. They had no, no idea how to stop this from happening again. So it's going to be up to the citizens to put the pressure on to make them do their job. And isn't that always the case? Now, yes. is it true that the NRC lowered their standards in order to approve the new canister and hid justification for approving it for high burn of fuel storage and transport? Yes. The NRC has not proved any transport cast for high burn of fuel. They do not have the data to show that it's safe to transport. It's mainly because of the of the cladding failure they're finding with uh, the high burn-up fuel. And this has been a long-standing guidance for many years. Well, they decided in this process for this new uh, new Home 32 assembly canister to approve it for high burn-up fuel storage and transport. And testing to back it up? Well, I read the detailed specifications that went with the NRC approval. And under the section where it talks about high burn-up, it just says proprietary. So they're not sharing zero justification about how they're approving this. And in addition, in terms of mitigation, meaning what should Edison do if one of those casts fails under what that process is, again, proprietary. They don't have an answer to mitigate 
a cash failure. They have no solutions. And to try and sneak this through, push this through, with absolutely no justification to the public that the public can see. So Diane Curran, who's an attorney that's taken on the NRC numerous times, she submitted a comment on behalf of a number of environmental organizations and citizens challenging the approval, the NRC approval of this 32 assembly canister. And she said that that they can't just approve this this process that they're using to approve transfer to high burnup, it's, it's illegal. And whatever she said worked. The NRC has withdrawn their approval for this canister. And just in the nick of time because they're going to have approval to use it as of today. As of today, June 30th, 2014, all nuclear plants in the country would have been able to procure this canister, this inferior canister. So that's the good news, that it's been stopped. The bad news is we don't know exactly what the NRC is going to do. They said they're going to be rewriting it, and then they're going to be issuing something again, and no public comment will be allowed on whatever it is they issue. This is outrageous, you know. So we have a stall, so we need to use this stall time to try and stop Edison from selecting one of their bids. They're probably going to pick the, uh, the new homes canister. Commissioner Florio confirmed that the PUC gave Edison $7 million to lobby the NRC to get this new canister design approved so that they could buy it. So I have a copy of the letter that Edison sent to the NRC back in 2012 urging them to approve this Ariva's new canister design for this new home 32. Commissioner Florio did say that they have not approved the money for these canisters. He said that's going to be in the decommissioning proceeding, but I have not been able to find out what that is, and I have no idea what kind of backdoor decisions are being made. And this is above and beyond the $7 million that they've already authorized to SCE. That was, sounds like it was more like lobbying money. Yeah, it, that's what it was for. It was strictly for lobbying. It wasn't to buy one single canister. It was, it was strictly lobbying. And so I have no idea who got that $7 million. I have no idea who got that money. So apparently Edison had convinced the PUC that, that this was a good canister. The irony in that is I spoke to... San Onofre's Tom Palmazano, he's currently running the San Onofre. And I asked him, I said, well, Tom, with the layoffs that you've been having at San Onofre, do you have any technical experts, any engineers that are able to review these bids that you're getting from the company to make sure their products are good enough for us here in Southern California? I said, who do you rely on for your technical expertise? And he answered, the vendor, Ariva. <gasps> it's like asking the fox about hen house security. Yes. And I told, I told it to Commissioner Florio after I spoke to him after that PC meeting in Costa Mesa. I said, were you aware that Edison's relying on the vendor? Not just for technical information about the canisters that are good, but even how to, they're relying on them for all the technical support, you know, how many years to cool everything, the whole, the whole nine yards. We get pushback, the citizens that are talking to city council people, particularly in San Clemente here, we hear back, oh, we should let the experts, the Edison, they're the experts. We should leave it to the experts. Well, guess what? There are no experts at Edison. That's like relying on your car salesman to tell you, oh, this is the best car on the market without doing any research. This is insane. And it it was clear from Florio's face that he had no idea that Edison was relying on Ariva, this French company, for all their expertise. So out of self-survival, I've been doing research and found numerous scientific articles that confirm that we can be much safer in Southern California by choosing a higher quality canister design. Nobody seems to be following the canister issue. People are either concerned about stopping reprocessing because of the dangers there, or they're concerned about getting the fuel out of the spent fuel pools because the spent fuel pools are so dangerous. But nobody seems to be paying attention on what we're putting this fuel into. 
and this is critical. We have to do it right the first time or the cost of these canisters will be minor compared to losing Southern California, which is what's at stake here. But it's really up to us to get involved and and do this because nobody else is doing it. So what additional concerns might you have and what steps can we as activists take on this issue to move forward and support safety, sanity, and prudence as opposed to the lowest possible bidder? There's a couple of other things I, I think are critical to mention before I answer that. The high burn up fuel needs to be what they call canned. They need to take each fuel assembly and put it in an extra stainless steel container before they put it in the big canister. And this is something that the NRC requires if there's damaged fuel assemblies, such as the cladding's damage, they require them to put it in these extra cans that go in it. Well, this new design, this new 32 fuel assembly design, they eliminate cans altogether, so it's not even an option to put it in there, which, which makes storage and retrieval difficult, if not impossible. So that's another key issue of what they've done, how, that they've lowered the standards again. And in terms of what we can do, well, number one, we need to stop this bid process because once Edison is allowed to award that bid, it will probably be too late. So we need to urge the governor's office, your state elected officials, your local officials, because your local officials are supposed to represent you. Um, (laughs) Well, some of them do. Some of them do. We found down here in Southern California, we found that if we can educate our city council people, because they've been lied to. And we've been able to effectively educate them. We have handouts that have references to technical documents to prove what we're saying is the truth. And once they're educated and they get the facts, most of them get it, and and we get support at the local level. So we did that with the steam generator issue. It it looks like we need to, to do that again with this issue. I just don't know how much time we have. So we need to stop that bid process and also share this information with other people. On my website, stanandofreesafety.org, you can find more information about this issue. So get educated and share it with people. If you know people that have power and influence, share this information with them too. So somebody needs to wake up our governor, our public utility commission, our state legislature, and our local governments. They need to wake up to what we're facing here of how close we are to having amazing disasters. I can't do it by myself. I need some help. I'm, do, I'm doing the research. I'm working with the attorneys to slow this approval down, but I can't do it myself, so I need help. And if uh, people have questions or they want to get more involved, uh, they can uh, contact me via the website or the contact form, and I'd be more than happy to work with them. org. Correct. Donna Gilmore, thank you so much for the work you're doing for this eye-opening report because this is just a preview of what any community potentially is going to be facing at whatever point they get their nuclear reactors shut down. That's not the end of the problem. Have your happy dance, have your celebration, and then realize the work just moves on to a different arena. Right, exactly. Again, Donna, Thank you for being a guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Okay, it's my pleasure. That was Donna Gilmore. Her website is sananofresafety.org, and she is currently looking for individuals to join her in her elegantly honed battle against San Onofre. There's a contact form on the site. Feel free to use it. Scott Portsline of Three Mile Island Alert, the group in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, contacted me this morning with a breaking story about nuclear reactors and cyber vulnerability. Here's what he had to say. Today, the Department of Homeland Security reported that a sophisticated computer virus has been discovered at more than a 1,000 European and U.S. energy firms. Half of the attacks have infected computers in Spain and the United States. The ongoing attacks is believed to be a Russian state-sponsored Trojan virus designed to spy on energy producers. But more threatening than that is the virus infiltrates a company's virtual private networks and is capable of sabotage. This is being compared to the Stuxnet virus from a few years ago, which was used to destroy Iran's nuclear weapons program. 
here's what's being revealed at this time. The virus is known by two names, Energetic Bear and Dragonfly. And it gives the attacker the capability to disrupt energy systems and even destroy certain individual components. And it does this by taking over microprocessors called SCADA systems. SCADA, S-C-A-D-A. -A. It stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. It works by maliciously altering the instructions which control machines, valves, pressures, voltages, etc. In the case of Energetic Bear, attackers use this strategy called watering hole attacks. They accomplish this by putting Trojan-infected software on the SCADA manufacturer's websites. And then when a vendor went to update his software at the manufacturer's website, he downloaded this virus. And then the infected software creates a virtual private network and begins collecting data and reporting back to home base. It's capable of running additional routines such as collecting passwords and taking screenshots and collecting documents and cataloging documents on infected computers. Today I spoke with an NRC cybersecurity official who was totally unaware of the attack. So we don't know what impact at this point the software and the potential sabotage that could occur is having in the United States. One defense measure we don't yet have in the United States is a clearinghouse for these nuclear licensees. They should be required to report any cyber trouble they detect within 15 minutes, even if it's not understood that it's a normal computer problem or a cyber attack. That way, if there's a concerted effort by foreign enemies, we could head it off as early as possible. I've suggested this to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Some of the security people agree with me yet it has not been adopted. That was Scott Portsline of TMI Alert and a regular contributor to Nuclear Hot Seat. So what does it mean to find yourself accidentally in proximity to a leaking nuclear reactor? Find out in my new nuclear memoir, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. It's available as an ebook on Amazon Kindle, and you can check out a free excerpt by going to NuclearHotSeat.com and signing up in the big yellow box. You'll get the PDF by return email. Here's today's final thought. Last night, I attended a panel discussion on nuclear fission presented at facilities owned and operated by KPCC, the NPR station in Pasadena, California. It was an unabashed propaganda campaign for nuclear fission that smugly presented its glories as the answer to all humanity's energy problems, with only a little nuclear waste that was, they assured us, low-level and manageable. Yeah, right. The whole program was hosted by a smug little man named Matt Kaplan, who admitted he was an unabashed supporter of fusion energy, fascinated by the subject since childhood, and he proceeded to do everything but suck off the two of his three guests as he gushed about the wonders of their technology. The first was Ned R. Sotoff, director of the U.S. International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER, pronounced ITER, project at the Oak Ridge National Laboratories. ITER provided the Our Friend the Atom-esque film at the top about the miraculous wonders of fusion energy, with no downside! Isn't that surprising? The film was not labeled as to source until a very small, almost illegible logo at the end. It was pro-industry propaganda. Slick, expensive, professional. Definitely not the usual YouTube quality of video. Then we heard from John Parmentola from General Atomics Energy and Advanced Concepts Group. More engineering information impenetrable to any but the engineering geeks from nearby Caltech, and a few gray-haired physics hobbyists in shorts too short for the aging male physique. Never was heard a discouraging word about fusion. Until I managed to get a question, is that is. During the extremely short Q&A session, I managed to get up to express my shock that a trusted news organization like KPCC would be behind such a biased, one-sided presentation on a volatile subject. I did use the word propaganda, and then quickly, before the mic could be yanked away, asked, 
Since nuclear is perfectly safe until it isn't, what, if any, unintended consequences, scenarios, and worst possible credible disasters have you spun out as was done at the beginning of the nuclear age? Well, of course, nobody bothered to answer my question. Instead, the eater, eater moderator jumped in with, ah, the fear factor, to get a laugh. And then I was put down by impenetrable engineering language that at one point had John Parmentola of General Atomics stating authoritatively that if implemented, windmills would strip Italy of its entire landmass. What? Obfuscation, disinformation, hubris, smug put-downs, and dirty tricks. Isn't that just like the nuclear industry? Interestingly, even the Ph.D. professor from UC Irvine on the panel, William W. Helbrink, wasn't allowed a full say either. When he expressed concern that many of the problems of fusion haven't yet been solved, that what works theoretically doesn't necessarily work in real life, and then refused to answer a leading question as intended and would not predict what energy source, hint, fusion, fusion, would be implemented in 50 years, the suck-off boy moderator snarked at him and said, well, that's the difference between theoretical science and applied science, and then lobbed some softballs to his besties from the fantasy land of fusion as the answer. Because this was labeled an informational evening, the last thing these people wanted was contradiction, let alone debate. If there's any consolation, I learned after the fact that this was not officially a production of KPCC, though it was promoted on air and held in one of their facilities. Also, the guy hosting was not a member of their news or programming staff, but an outside vendor. The woman I spoke with afterwards, who is with KPCC and who does produce all the programming at the facility, not just this guy's science-oriented shows, spoke with me at some length, took my information, gave me hers, and she agreed to pass along any suggestions for future programming dealing with an alternative, dealing with an alternative perspective on nuclear to the environmental department. And I believe that she will. I left shaken but not stirred. At least some people in the audience, whether they liked what I had to say or not, got to hear that there are some other ideas than the propaganda they were receiving from the stage. And driving home in the car, I flashed on lyrics to a song by Buffy St. Marie. Down in the heart of town, the devil dresses up. He keeps his nails clean. Did you think he'd be the boogeyman? This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, July 1st, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Nuclear Materials Events Database, and their weekly events report, Washington State Department of Health, Triume, a publication of the Canadian National Laboratory, William Reed Business Media, EcoWatch.com, Change.org, Nature.com, German Federal Office for Radiation Protection, Asahi Shimbun, SafeEnergy.org, our friend Iori Mochizuki and his blog, Fukushima Diary, June Hori, NewYorkTimes.com, the Facebook group Chernobyl Children, Fukushima Children, Dianukes.org, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. I love you guys. My thanks to all the activists who provided me with source material for the Fusion Confusion event at KPCC, with special gratitude to Mary Beth Brangan of Eon 3, whose question I ultimately used. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. We're on three times a week, including a flashback random replay on Tuesdays. We also appear on airprogressive.com. Our archive is available on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, or you can find it on iTunes. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed. You have permission to reuse granted as long as you are a nonprofit, Provide proper attribution, website, and email. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art 